Um, welcome everyone to this month's episode of our uh, monthly Vanderbilt University School of Engineering uh, graduate program conversation hour. And this month, I am very happy to announce that we are joined with three current graduate students from our civil engineering program. Um, I'll let them each do their own personal introduction. I'll just call on them. Uh, so yes, so tonight we're going to be talking about what is life like for graduate students that are in the civil engineering program, what kind of research uh, or what we you know what's just, you know, when it comes to just kind of the day to day, you know, life of a day, you know, day life of the graduate student, you know, what is that all about? What does that entail? What's the graduate student timeline that we look at when it comes to that? But then also we're going to talk about a little bit about the application process, a little about, you know, what to expect when applying to graduate school. So we're going to cover all that in tonight's session. Um, just wanted to say real quick uh, before we begin. Uh, so there is a registration link that just went out. Um, and so if you have not yet um, registered in our uh, system for tonight's event, I highly encourage you to do so just because um, we will be able to follow up with you after tonight's session. Uh, so I'm, my name is Gabriel Luis. So I'm the director of graduate recruitment for our School of Engineering. Um, and so, yeah, so if you're interested, uh, please do fill out that online registration and I'll be happy to um, follow up with you after today's event about our graduate programs and summer research opportunities in engineering. Um, with that being the case, let's go ahead and begin. Um, if you have any questions throughout tonight's session, please feel free to use the chat feature and we will be able to see your messages here on our system. Um, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can throughout tonight's event. Um, okay, well, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and have everybody do a brief self-introduction. If you can just tell us your name, uh, your area of research, and then your degree program. And we'll start with that. Uh, so Oliver, would you like to go first? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Oliver Stover. I'm a third year PhD student here at Vanderbilt in the civil engineering department. Uh, where I mostly study risk-informed decision-making for large stochastic systems. My biggest project being about power systems, which is an incredibly exciting topic given some of the challenges facing um, the global community. Uh, I had a little bit of an untraditional background coming to the graduate program. I uh, graduated um, from Cornell University with a degree in mechanical engineering in 2013 and then spent five years uh, working as an engineer, um, mostly doing as a, a risk engineer uh, at an oil refinery in Chalmette, Louisiana, just outside of New Orleans, and totally fell in love with risk-informed decision-making, um, but also saw that there was all these data uh, that they weren't necessarily using in, in an automated or interesting way, um, and got online and heard about this program at Vanderbilt that was doing all this cool stuff with data and risk-informed decision-making and applied, and here I am. And we lost Luis. I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Madeline Allen. I'm a second-year graduate student, also in the civil engineering department. I'm in the civil and infrastructure systems program. Uh, working with Dr. Mark Akowitz, and my research focuses on flood risks broadly, but um, recently has kind of been honing in on how uh, decision-making processes at the individual scale um, influence how uh, effective flood adaptation strategies are at kind of the community level and beyond. Um, and recently, I've been getting really passionate at kind of tying in the social justice implications of different flood adaptation strategies. So. Uh, my research is, is excitingly at the um, kind of intersection of a lot of different disciplines, and it's fun kind of looking at all of it through this civil engineering lens. Um, also somewhat non-traditional, my background is in earth environmental sciences, uh, so I got a Bachelor of Arts in that, and then came here to pursue my graduate studies in civil engineering. Um, so if you have questions about that, definitely feel free to ask me. Um, yeah, I'll hand it over to Rajesh. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rajesh Kotel, uh, also a second year PhD student here. Um, so my background is in civil engineering. I did my undergrad um, uh, in Kathmandu, Nepal, uh, from the Kathmandu University. I graduated in 2014 and then came to the US in 2018 for my master's uh, in water resources engineering. And my current um, focus on in, in my PhD degree is uh, is on risk and reliability of uh, critical infrastructure systems. 
So again, uh, it's not a linear path that I took from civil engineering to water resources to uh, critical infrastructure systems, uh, risk, and, risk and reliability. Uh, but again, like Oliver mentioned, there is so much data and, and applications of, of, of data um, uh, to be had in, in civil engineering, uh, which I was interested in and to leverage this, uh, this particular niche. So um, here I am into the second year of my, uh, uh, my program here. All right. Well, thank you so much for those introductions. And, and um, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, and, and it's something that I think, you know, that, that, that a lot of, you know, one reason why students like to or join or want to become part of the Vanderbilt community is because of that interdisciplinary nature that we see, not only just in civil engineering, but just across the board. And, and you can hear that just from our graduate students introduction. I mean, people, for the most part, students, you know, are not just involved in one particular linear, you know, uh, direction when it comes to research and in, in, in civil engineering, but it could spread out to multiple different areas and research institutes and other schools even on campus. And so that's something that's a, a very common theme that, that you'll hear a lot of um, in tonight's conversation, especially when we talk about research. Next question. Um, so why graduate school? So like, why did you decide to go to graduate school? That's I think that's one important question that a lot of our viewers will want to know. I can go first. Uh, my kind of first and foremost reason is that I love learning. Um, I was super excited to come back to school and take more classes. Like that was kind of at the top of my list of, of things I was excited about. Uh, and then beyond that, I love doing research. I think that the type of research that kind of happens in the academic uh, sphere in general is really exciting. There's a lot of kind of freedom with what dire direction you take uh, things in. So. I was looking forward to getting back to that, but um, prior to returning to graduate school, I did a few different internships um, with NASA and the Forest Service and uh, kind of got a taste of some of the jobs that I might want someday. And for me personally, a lot of the jobs that I was seeing both in just general career searching, but also within those organizations from just talking to people, doing a few informational interviews and just kind of getting a, a sense of um, what jobs are out there. A lot of the people that had jobs that I found really cool and really exciting had PhDs. So I kind of knew that in general, that was going to be an inevitable part of my direction. I'll go next. Yeah. Um, so my, uh, both my parents are professors. Uh, my dad is the first person in his family to graduate from high school and then went on to get a college degree and just seeing how much um, a college degree changed his life. Um, he, it's Education is a huge part of my family. Uh, my mom got her PhD um, as a non-traditional student when she was raising us working full time. So basically, as soon as I graduated from undergrad, they started pestering me about when I was going to get my PhD. So it was inevitable. Uh, but really what uh, got me here as I was starting to study for the PE and um, realized how much I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> and what I had enjoyed about my job and what the classes I thought about all the time from undergrad were all this, um, how to use data to make decisions. And I started to look around about who was studying that um, and realizing that there was a gap in my industry community that I wanted to fill and uh, looked at the research that people were doing and was just incredibly excited about what was going on. And uh, my mom would stop pestering me. So two birds. <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, it was uh, it developed kind of uh, organically over time. Uh, so as soon as I was done with my undergrad, uh, I wanted to focus on a certain area, which was uh, water resources. And I did my master's and I was working uh, as a water resources engineer. Um, and I was responsible for uh, risk analysis of uh, water distribution networks. And then there I realized uh, how, how important this tool could be um, you know, uh, using uh, the vastly available data in different sectors to actually improve those areas in, in, in critical infra infrastructure systems. And that's when I started looking for uh, PhD programs. And um, the program that I'm currently in uh, was the top of the list. So um, uh, it was kind of step on step. Um, and in, in search of specializing in something, 
um, I wanted to sort of uh, also broaden my, my the scope of, uh, of of my expertise uh, so that I can use data to to leverage these um, uh, you know the, the the vastly available data in in different aspects rather than just water resources in general. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing that um, information. Um, and so we went from uh, the why graduate school. Now we're gonna. I'm gonna ask. So why Vanderbilt? Why did you decide to apply to Vanderbilt? So, yeah, I'm gonna start. Um, uh, so <laughs> um, the the area that I was looking at for my PhD. Uh, was a very specific one. Like it, it needed to be, um, it needed to combine data science and civil engineering. And I was looking for uh, programs that specifically supplied this. And uh, uh, the program at Vanderbilt uh, pretty much came out the top of the list uh, in that in that aspect. And uh, also, this is pretty much the only program that I applied to. Um, Given my interactions with uh, with the professors here and uh, whatever I I known about Vanderbilt, um, and I, so I decided to apply to Vanderbilt, and uh, yeah, that was the process. The entire process was revolved around uh, what I wanted to do with my PhD, and um, during that process, uh, I saw the the program here, which in in turn uh, uh, pushed me to learn more more about Vanderbilt. Yeah, also a um, similar story. I um, When I initially thought about going back to grad school, I was just sort of curious one day if even people did research. I like kind of vaguely had a feeling that this was an interesting problem and was trying to see if anyone was even thinking about this because I didn't even hear anyone in my, in my company talking about this. And I Googled it and this uh, two names kept coming up, which is uh, Dr. Mahadevan and Dr. Baroud, who are both now the co-PIs on the project I work on. And they were just by far and away uh, had more interesting ideas, a more comprehensive story of how to use data to make deci risk informed decisions and how to do it in an automated way. Um, so it was just a no brainer. It was also the only PhD program I applied to, applied to some other master's programs, but nobody had quite thought about this problem the way we were thinking about it here. Yeah, um, following up, I had a slightly different path. I actually was engaged in research with the civil engineering department as an undergrad. I got my undergrad degree from Vanderbilt. So I kind of already had a sneak peek at the department and uh, the faculty here and was just really excited to return um, to continue my, my studies in this department. Uh, so I guess on, on that hand, um, slightly different from you guys, but similarly also only applied here uh, really had kind of my, my heart set on this and I'm excited to be back. All right. So many fascinating avenues and stories of how we all arrived to Vanderbilt. Um, and on that, so when it comes to the application, obviously for our viewers, they probably have, you know, numerous questions about, you know, what are some things, you know, as successful applicants, people who are now in the program, do you think worked for you on the application or maybe some tips or advice that you could give out to those listening right now in terms of uh, what are some things to watch out for just to, to, to just be on the lookout when it comes to the application. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of take a stab at this first. Um, I would say broadly speaking, uh, I mean, I'm sure that the people that actually review the applications have a better answer for this, but from my perspective, the kind of two main questions that a reviewer probably is, is thinking when they're reading applications is, can you handle graduate level coursework? And are you going to be able to produce uh, really high quality research? And I think um, a key element to both of those is just passion and excitement for the topics that you're going to be studying and doing research on. I think that making sure that it comes across um, very clearly, you know, why you're excited about the problems that you're planning to tackle um, that's probably, you know, item number one to get across in your application. And I think any experiences that you have in terms of um, relevant coursework or more importantly, research experiences where you've enjoyed that kind of process of, of having some kind of broad question or um, issue that you kind of dive into and both, you know, think independently on, but are able to collaborate with other researchers to, to kind of come up with some 
um, somewhat polished final product. Um, I think all of those play into it, and I think those are all important things to kind of include in your in your application. I didn't have any research experience coming in. Um, I went to an undergraduate university with a really strong co-op program, and that's what I did because I always thought I was going to be an industry industry for life engineer. Uh, I was planning just to be a working engineer. And so I would encourage people who haven't had research experience to not be afraid to apply. And um, to Maddie's point, do illustrate that you have experience answering open-ended complex problems and that you're a self-starter who can um, manage your own projects. Because that's really what research is. For me, it feels a lot like... Um, it feels exactly like when I was doing a big project at work. Like, do you set a schedule? Do you have a chart? What's your critical path? And are you comfortable with like kind of vague questions and coming up with solutions? And if you're comfortable with those things, you can do research. And so I would highlight those experiences. Yeah, um, to add to those, I think it's very important to be clear in what you're interested in yeah. um, and sort of, uh, uh, honing on, on, on those topics uh, rather than uh, just generally take a stab at different things. Um, that helps a lot, I think, especially from my, I can tell from my experience because uh, that went into um, the process of, of looking for programs uh, in this field, first of all. And also the professor that I was in contact with, uh, she clearly saw that, yeah, this is, this is what I have in mind and this is what the program offers and what the fit is between the two programs. So uh, in taking the time to really understand your interests and the program that you're applying to, I think those are very important in the process. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I do see we have a um, one of our viewers sent two questions over. So I'm actually just gonna jump in and ask those, those questions real quick. So the first question is about, um, can you talk a little bit about the structures and materials research areas in, um, in, 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 in civil engineering? We have it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, jump, go jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but we have two kind of like schools of thought doing really cool research about structures. We have people who are doing like multimodal modeling, Dr. Oske for composites, incredibly exciting stuff as composites become more integral to, to modern systems. Also in my group, we do some research about additive manufacturing, so 3D printing. So not only not only thinking about 3D printing, but also thinking about the high levels of uncertainties that go with it. And then we also have some folks to do some concrete research, both in like a nuclear context and a water context with uh, Dr. Sanchez. Anybody else I'm missing? Maddie? That was a great overview. I'm sure that there's more information out there. Yep. Um, not my forte either, so that was a perfect overview. <laughs> These are the risk people, unfortunately, tonight. <laughs> yeah. Got one half the story here. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Good, nice, good question. Then the second question. Now, um, just for our viewers, so the students that we have on the call tonight are all PhD students. Um, now, there are, we do have a master's uh, program. We, have, we do have master's of engineering as well as master's of science students in civil engineering. Um, so actually, I mean, Feel free to jump in and, and if you know the answer to this question, I can answer it uh, but just because I also work with master's students. Um, so when it comes to RA and TAing, those positions are mostly gonna be for the PhD students, at least within our school of engineering. Now, with that being the case, we do have some faculty members that will take um, masters, mostly masters of science students, um, and they will, they will invite them to be RAs within their labs. Um, so there, at times there are, there is some funding available for those students, but it is really on a case by case basis. Um, but now as of several weeks ago for all of our master's students, whether it be master's of engineering, master's of science students will now receive a $10,000 fellowship for the entirety of the program. So that is a new, um, initiative that we're starting up now with our, for our master's students. So I just wanted to put that in there. Um, now with that being the case. We do have a master's of engineering and construction management and actually with that program we do provide a 50 percent tuition fee waiver for the students in that program so that's another really neat area where we have funding for master's students um but other than that for the most part it, the rest of the program is going to be self-funded um by the by the students uh, now with that being the case the, 
PhD programs are fully funded by the university. Um, so there, there are different models here that we see. Uh, but yes, but very good question. And it, I don't know, it, does anybody here want to add anything else to that? Or is that pretty? Yes, go ahead, Maddie. I just wanted to say, I have friends at other schools and PhD programs that are, the funding is, is much less ideal. I think Vanderbilt does a great job kind of ensuring that you get um, you know, this, this yearly kind of amount. Um, and I think it's great to not have to worry about that while you're trying to pursue school. I think it's really tricky to, you know, be taking on additional student loans or be trying to like figure out all of your, you know, life expenses, um, in a non, non fully funded program. So Vanderbilt does a, a great job with that. Um, yes. also, to, to add to it, um, I don't know if uh, the person asking the question is aware because uh, some uh, some uh, universities and programs they do not directly recruit uh, students from uh, after their undergrads, mm -hmm. uh, but ours does. I think as far as I as it I does. Know. That's me. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, if you are trying to get into a funded program right after your undergraduate, uh, applying for PhD would also not be a bad idea. If you are, if you if you know that uh, you that's that's the path you want to take. Yeah, I think we have quite a few people who are either straight from uh, undergrad or industry than undergrad, um, super successful. We have both. Yeah. But yes, Re Rajesh, I think that's a very good point because there are some students that might think they need a master's degree before they can apply to the PhD program, and that is not the case with Vanderbilt. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yes, very important point. Um, so yes, no, I mean, that's, thank you very much um, for the questions that were asked. Um, now I'll hop on to another question. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about uh, what is a day in the life of a graduate student at Vanderbilt? Like, what do you do? What's kind of your daily schedule? You know, what is kind of the, what's your routine? I think that's something a lot of prospective students want to want to learn about. Absolutely. I can tackle this one first. Um, I will say that uh, things are a bit different with COVID, of course. Um, there's slightly less uh, socializing in general. Um, but that being said, still lots of opportunities to, to meet with peers and colleagues and friends and whatnot. So for me, an average day would be uh, heading into to work earlier in the morning. Um, I have an office with a bunch of other grad students, and that in itself is really fun. Um, just getting to kind of chat with others in the office um, or in the hallways. Um, and then I, I'm still in classes because I'm in my, my second year. So I have classes, uh, and I spend most of the rest of the time either in the office or um, we have like the most beautiful campus in the world, I'm convinced. Uh, and today was lovely. It was, uh, I think almost 60, but it was perfectly sunny today. So I actually did a bunch of work outside um, with a classmate earlier in the day and then just took meetings out there for the rest of the day. Uh, so lots of places to, to sit on campus and enjoy um, the views and the sunshine. Uh, Nashville has a great climate. <laughs> so um, for me, it's kind of, yeah, most of the time is in is in the office or somewhere on campus. Um, there's tons of great lunch spots on campus through the Vanderbilt Dining Program, as well as right next to campus. One of my favorite taco places, Satco, is, is a quick walk from the office. So um, yeah, that's kind of my normal day. And then I, I go home. I live near campus. Um, I don't know if we'll talk about housing later, but that's oftentimes a hot topic. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, a typical day it depends on. I, I feel like it depends on, on what stage of your program you're in. Uh, first year is gonna be probably gonna be uh, a lot course intensive, so a lot of classes going on, some time for research. Uh, pretty busy, uh, as would you would expect uh, with with graduate school. Um, and as you go later on in, in, into the program uh, from the, let's say, second year onwards, the, the course load is going to be slightly lower, but your focus is going to be more on the research side of things. Um, so that's how it sort of transitions um, from the start to, 
um, as, as you move later into, into the program. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably in that later stage. Uh, I'm done with coursework, so I'm, I'm just a full-time researcher. Um, and uh, with COVID, it's been a little different. I've been mostly working from home. Unfortunately, I don't get to see Rajesh and I share an office, the infinite, the infamous fun office. We have a good time. We, we, we really, we all enjoy each other, um, in between working hard. Um, so probably my life would be equal parts reading other people's papers about what I'm researching, coding, uh, waiting for code to run, um, having like existential thoughts about my results, <laughs> writing, and then convincing other people of what I've come to after my existential thoughts. Uh, that would probably be what I do. Uh, so it's a lot of thinking, reading, coding, um, and yeah, Zoom meetings because we, we are in a really collaborative environment. So trying to kind of communicate and um, yeah, I have a really, I'm really lucky. I have an incredibly um, hands-on and um, interested advisor. So I meet with him and he um, he he's gives just really lovely suggestions. So probably on a weekly basis, is, that's pretty typical, I think. Yeah. I wanted to add one thing to what Rajesh was saying. Um, I think one cool thing about the coursework is that, at least from my experience, you can kind of decide how you want to distribute the courses. Yeah. Um, for example, I am at the beginning of my second year and I did decide to take like a really low light load this semester. So I'm only taking one class and then a lot of research hours and then lots of other research on top of that. Um, uh, and there was a lot of reasons for that. Part of it is I just really wanted to focus in on, on part of my research, but I'll be taking like a pretty large load next semester um, and planning to probably have a couple of my courses maybe go into my third year. And I know a lot of other people that have um, spaced it out in different ways too, where, you know, maybe the first three years of their program all involve coursework. Um, so I think it's really cool that you can just kind of decide basically semester by semester with your advisor, what makes the most sense for what you're trying to tackle. Um, sometimes it's also a matter of certain courses being offered every other year um, and just planning that, that out. So I think that everyone's path looks a bit different in that realm. Um, and there's tons of flexibility surrounding when and, and how to do the coursework. So yeah, just wanted to say that because I, I love that aspect of the program. I also think it's really cool. We have such a small program that um, oftentimes what you're doing in your research and what you're doing in your coursework, like the teacher and your PI can kind of like collaborate to like make that meaningful. Um, so I had one paper, oftentimes you'll have a project as a part of your course. So I had one paper come out of my uh, one of my courses I took my first year that just got published. Um, my I have two other papers that came out of a project from one of my courses that are almost done. And then the one of the courses I took, literally the professor was like, I'm going to borrow Oliver for this. I have a cool project that we're going to work on. This is going to be your project. Um, so it's really cool that actually oftentimes the professors really, really work with you to make your coursework and your research work. And because we're such a small program, they usually kind of like know what's going on in your life. And it ends up like being really like a, like a lot of synch I can't synergy. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, and a, a really fun time saving way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very good point you make um, that close knit feel that you get by being not only just in the School of Engineering in general, but especially in programs like civil environmental engineering that are particularly, you know, close knit because of the size and the accessibility that you have to faculty. And yeah, I mean, just the overall numbers right now in terms of our um, graduate program in engineering, the faculty to student ratio is one to six right now. So that just kind of gives you an idea of those, you know, just that very small class feel. Um, so very much, yeah great uh great environment when it comes to that when it comes to just being able to get to know your faculty members your lab mates everybody is able to establish really those close ties which is important um all right well great well thank you so much for sharing that information and on to the next question uh which is tell us a little bit more in detail uh you know about talk to us a little bit more in detail about your research i guess i'll go first um i kind of have uh a lot of things cooking right now so i'm just gonna kind of pick one area that i've been focusing on and and share information about that 
Uh, I took a really interesting course on agent-based modeling taught by Dr. Jonathan Gilligan um, last semester. And uh, just kind of a brief description, agent-based modeling basically focuses on, on creating a population of some heterogeneous uh, agents that, you know, in, have different kind of decision making processes and, and learn in different ways and you kind of program all that into the model but it's a really fantastic way to represent a heterogeneous population and, and look at different levels beyond that and have potentially different kind of hierarchy of of agents within a system so for me i think a lot about flood risk and um people's kind of perception of flood risk and varying degrees of um risk tolerance play very heavily into how they make decisions um, when faced with flood hazards. And uh, as kind of flood hazards um, increase in some areas due to the climate change, I'm really interested in, you know, what adaptation strategies um, are both effective and socially just and how can we kind of uh, test those out ahead of time. So I've been diving into trying to kind of create this model to explore that. And I um, just finished my preliminary exam on that topic. So that was really exciting, a big check mark within this PhD program. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about right now, but I've done um, a variety of stuff. A lot of my uh, research does kind of hone in on the, the lens of transportation and the kind of connection of different um, essential facilities with populations. Um, and like I kind of said previously, my research is really interdisciplinary. So it's exciting to get to work with um, experts from the civil engineering department, but I still um, kind of have professors and, and research faculty from the earth environmental science department weigh in, sometimes the um, social sciences. I have some contacts there that end up weighing in. So very cool. and. Uh, the people in this department really support my kind of interdisciplinary interests, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, go ahead, Josh. <laughs> yeah, I'll go next. Um, so my research um, is centered around uh, developing a risk analysis framework for uh, transportation in the Arctic. Um, so for this, we look at different um, incident records in the Arctic, the traffic records, uh, the, the several policy changes over, over the past few years, the change in climate, uh, the data related to all of these, and the impact of, of, of such changes um, on the economy, on different communities, and combine them together to sort of make a framework to, uh, to regulate and uh, sort of in inform um, the risk associated with uh, um, with traversing the Arctic uh, through uh, using using ships. Um, so that's the primary project that I'm involved in right now. Um, a lot of uh, data science techniques uh, pertaining to machine learning um, are going to be in use in developing the, the, the framework. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that's that's the primary focus with my research work right now. Um, yeah, so as I said earlier, I, I mostly look at how do you predict risk, um, not as like a single deterministic number, but as a stochastic number, thinking about all the uncertainties in, in large systems. So I've worked uh, in commercial aviation traffic. I'm working on a pedestrian traffic, uh, pedestrian safety problem right now, which is scary. Be careful walking. It's, it's a real, real challenge right now to a lot of communities. Um, but the thing I'm mostly interested in is power systems. Um, so I'm working with a group of us here at Vanderbilt, and we're also working with some folks at Georgia Tech. And um, we're on a grant from DOE, and we're sort of kind of fundamentally rethinking how we do daily scheduling uh, and, and short-term risk assessment in the power grid. So how do we decide which generators run? And right now, the way they make those decisions is they just predict a single mean value for the load, uh, load demand, wind generation, and solar generation. Um, which is obviously not going to be tenable um, as the grid um, electrifies more electric vehicles. You have more smart uh, infrastructure that's going to adjust its output, uh, its how much power it's using based on price signals. And then also as we get more wind. 
So it's just not tenable with the challenges that are coming down the road. So we're kind of fundamentally rethinking that problem. So one of the first things we did is we came up with some cool ways to do probabilistic forecasting. So I'm sure machine learning is some, some things people are excited about. Uh, so we did some machine learning forecasting, um, explored three different models to do that. We also like rethought how to think about uh, the risk associated with a cert certain decision and kind of where we're headed next is how, if I've got decision A or decision B, how do I decide between them, especially if they're like sort of both uncertain? So like the classic example would be like, what if they're both, uh, they have the same expected value, but one has like a wider distribution, which do I choose? Um, that's kind of where we're headed next of how to help um, power system operators kind of make these decisions in, in a risk informed way. Yeah, so that's actually, that's, that's very fascinating. And, and we could actually just dedicate a whole series of talks just to talk, just to, just to discuss research and all the different really neat uh, fields that, that we offer in civil engineering. But thank you for that introduction. Um, the next question I want to go into is, um, so t tell us a little bit about your experience just in, just being in Nashville. Like what are kind of your go-to places, you know, uh, just kind of what, what's your impression of Nashville? I'll go first. I love Nashville. Um, absolutely love it. Uh, I spent my undergraduate years here uh, and then moved away and was a lot of different places for a couple years and then made my way back to Nashville because I missed it. Um, I think it's a great city. My favorite part about it, I would say, is just how central music is to everything here. I honestly feel like anywhere you are in the city, there is live music happening right next door to you. Um, so that's probably my my favorite part of the city itself. They, yeah, tons of concerts, but also just lots of live music in either bars or just coffee shops or just on the street. Um, it's just kind of uh, a central component of the culture in this city, which is really fun. And then I also just love kind of the rolling green hills of Tennessee in general. It's a beautiful area. Um, if you get a little bit outside of the city, you're kind of surrounded by nature and, and greenery and open skies. And I think that that's um, a beautiful place to be. I love going to, to Franklin or Leapers Fork for a day just to kind of get away from the hustle and bustle. And um, we're only a couple hours from the Smokies. I was in Asheville, North Carolina this weekend with some friends. So we're close to a lot of things. It's a fantastic place to be. Um, if you don't end up coming to school here, you should at least visit because it's it's amazing. <laughs> I nominate Oliver next to talk. <laughs> Music's good. Hiking's good. Uh, and uh, I like Van. There's a lot going on at Vanderbilt. Unfortunately, with COVID, it's been tough. But before COVID, I would regularly like stay late and go to a talk or something like that. Um, so they like bring in cool writers or cool speakers. My like dad's favorite historian is a professor here. So I like have seen him talk or like Al Gore will just like pop in every once in a while. So it's always cool. There's always something cool going on. Uh, East Tennessee is genuinely very beautiful. Uh, hiking here is world-class, like very right outside of, right outside of Nashville for sure. That's been my favorite part, um, going out to East Tennessee to hike. Yeah, for me, um, when I came to the U.S., I was um, so I spent the first couple of years in a smaller uh, size town, uh, which was a college town. So uh, Nashville um, was fundamentally different from um, is fundamentally different from my experiences there. Um, but um, the, the the cool part of Nashville that I that I really really like is that I live close to campus and there are pockets where you can be in the city and not feel like you're in the city. Um, and if you have a choice of whether you want to spend your time slightly outside of uh, the the city environment or if you want to step into the city, it's it's not too far. Um, and there are some really uh, good experiences in within the uh, the, the, the downtown uh, depending on your case in in uh, um, in general um, ambience of the of the streets um, and I feel like um, 
also because I'm a huge soccer fan, there is a a really nice uh, soccer team that um, it, it's a fairly new franchise, but it's developing pretty well. Um, and they're yeah they're doing pretty well. It's um, and 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 also Vanderbilt, um, uh, different sports at Vanderbilt. I really like attending um, these events. So all in all, very very satisfied with with life in Nashville. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot going on here. And to Rajesh's point about the soccer team, so the Nashville SC Major League Soccer Team in Nashville now. And because of that, last year, Nashville was able to host a World Cup qualifying game against Team USA and Canada, which that was a first. And that was really neat to be able to have to be able to see these types of you know games now in Nashville. But yeah, a lot going on. Great balance of being in a place where you can experience city life, but also experience living in the outdoors all in one place with one of the fastest growing economies in the U.S. right now. So really neat stuff a lot of a lot of really neat things happening so thank you for that um next question uh so what's something that you wish you knew before applying to graduate school is there something that was just kind of like man i really wish i knew that you know before you know going into to your program or just graduate school in general that you think um would be great to share with everybody I guess, look, can I share something that somebody told me to do that I did that was wise? Yes, I think we would all want to hear that, yeah. <laughs> uh, doc, Dr. Maha told me uh, kind of in an offhanded comment, oh, yeah, we mostly code in Python. Do you know Python? I was like, no, I'm a MATLAB guy. I'm an engineer. He was like, maybe learn that. And uh, I did, and boy, was I glad. <laughs> so that I would suggest that. Of just there are so many free, like, just YouTube courses that you can even do in a weekend. Um, and I was super glad I did. Jumping in, kind of following that train of thought, shifting the question a tiny bit. One thing I am really glad that I did before grad school, um, and I'm definitely not saying that everyone has to do this, but I personally really liked getting some experience in the workforce, seeing some different jobs, feeling what certain jobs would be like, seeing people with jobs that I might want one day. Um, just getting a sense of that, uh, the work that I did really focused on how do we better integrate, um, remote sensing data into decision-making practices and streamline that process so that, uh, decisions at, at various levels are data-driven. And it got me super excited for a lot of the courses that I ended up taking. I've taken courses in remote sensing, machine learning, agent-based modeling, groundwater hydrology, and all of them kind of stem from what I had seen in the workforce and was excited to do at some point. Um, so for me personally, it worked out really well uh, having those experiences before coming back to grad school. Um, so that's kind of my two cents. Obviously everyone's different. If that doesn't feel like it makes sense for you, then totally disregard my comment. But I, I loved that portion of my experience. I'll second what Maddie said. I think I have a huge advantage having worked um, both from a hard skills perspective because it gave me perspective on how they would use it gave me passion but from a soft skills perspective like i felt like i was uh better time skills management like more willing to like be uncomfortable instead of being like i don't know and i'm going to give up it was sort of like well you've seen a lot of things you didn't know before and if you just stick with it for like an hour you're going to figure it out um i agree i i found it to be an advantage yeah i think that's something we all have in common uh the three of us here um, I worked for a while after my undergrad, and then I um, did my master's and then worked for a bit after that, and then finally joined the PhD here. Um, so I would also say that it's very useful in, um, in, in shaping um, your interests um, and also your character in, in handling the, the type of problems that you are going to encounter in your PhD. Uh, so it requires a certain level of grit, um, yeah. and and you get that uh, from industry experience, in my opinion, also. Um, and all, to add to that, I I feel like uh, every graduate uh, program um, is a different experience in its own. So you're never really fully prepared. So it's it really depends on uh, building your mentality to to, to take uh, you know whatever comes your way, and and to make the most of it, and uh, you know. Uh, and thrive in it, um, uh, I'd say um, uh, that's really important. 
that that just reminded me of something that I want to add on here. And it kind of goes back to the question on um, what do you think made you a strong applicant? And I think we all just kind of touched on it right now. But just this ability to both kind of teach yourself something or learn yeah. something independently and just keep at it and be comfortable in that realm of like, okay, I have to write a script in this language to do this. And like, maybe you either don't know the language well, or you haven't done this kind of niche aspect of it. And having that kind of comfort level of being like, okay, there's going to be a lot of Googling. There's going to be some maybe asking peers or faculty, et cetera. But just knowing that having that kind of like confidence and excitement to just slightly bang your head against the wall and figure it out. Like, I think that that makes you such a strong applicant and such a strong researcher to just be like, yeah, I know I'm going to figure this out if I don't know it already. Yes, no, great points. Um, and thank you for, for mentioning that. Uh, and with, um, with that being the case, so I just wanted to let our viewers know we are still taking questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send them our way and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. We do have some time left uh, in today's session. Um, let me ask a question about student services at Vanderbilt. Like for example, you know, if we're talking about just the graduate student experience in general, like have, you know, in your opinion, you know, how does, uh, you know, how, have, you know, whether it be, you know, just knowing about different, being able to participate in different student organizations, knowing that there's all these different support systems, you know, at the university, is there anything that you want to share about, you know, just kind of the graduate student experience in general when it comes to all the different resources available on campus for the students? I'll jump in here. There are a ton of resources on this campus. Um, I have been really impressed with Vanderbilt over the years um, at the the things that they offer. So there's a writing center that I've gone to dozens of times. Um, for me personally, several as undergrad, but also as a grad student, which can be super helpful, even in just giving yourself a timeline of like, I'm going to get something done by this point to talk to this person at the writing center about it. And I've friends that have worked at the writing center. So if you're also very into writing, you could get a job there as well. Um, but that's super helpful. Uh, they also have, we have these academic life coaches um, that are available for both like one-on-one -on -one kind of little counseling sessions, as well as kind of group um, exercises in, you know, how to handle certain stressors, how to navigate certain academic or professional situations, et cetera. Um, I have engaged in those groups and sessions and they've been amazing and um, very kind of uh, motivating and exciting. Um, there's career services here that are fantastic. They'll look over interview or resumes for you. They'll help you prep for interviews, help you explore different um, career options. Uh, so those are some of the like Vanderbilt related ones in terms of like higher level of Vanderbilt. But there's also tons of student organizations that do a whole bunch of different things that you can either, um, you know, participate in events or participate in the org itself. Um, I mean, there are just, there are hundreds, I couldn't even name them now, but there's a lot of different kind of like cultural ones, sports ones, um, more academic related ones, outreach and community service related ones. Um, yeah, so many, but definitely feel free to ask us more questions if you have um, specific questions about that. And maybe Oliver can talk a little bit about grad student council and- Yeah, I would also add, um if I'm going to make a bold statement, I think we have the best center for teaching and learning in the entire country. And I don't just say that uneducated. My mom is literally a professor in education who, when I got into Vanderbilt, said, Oliver, you have the best center for teaching and learning in the country at Vanderbilt. <laughs> um, so if you're interested, if you're really interested in teaching, uh, being a college professor, this is the place to be. Um, we have a program where you can get a certificate in um, uh, college teaching, but they're genuinely interested in not only um, making sure you have the technical skills, but helping you communicate those effectively using the um, most cutting edge uh, pedagogy in your, in your classes. Um, and so it's just an incredible place to learn about teaching. Um, also our outdoor rec program is cool that you can like rent equipment, um, which is cool because we have this great um, outdoor space that is Tennessee. But uh, yeah, we, we have um, 
but the graduate student council. So all the graduate students are kind of organized in a little student council. And we have one of our graduate students is the vice president, I think. Yeah. Um, and they regularly have events, um, especially non-COVID times. They usually have an all graduate student social twice a semester, which is delightful to meet just some of the most passionate nerds in your life, just about anything. So you can have a great conversation with someone who's like, let me tell you about medieval literature that I'm studying. And it's fascinating and it's fun. And it's a great way to meet, get out of your kind of little world. Um, and then we have a, um, a little graduate student council, which I've been lucky enough to be the president of. And we're, it's a, an amazing opportunity to kind of um, try to figure out what, what are, what are people's challenges? What are people not understanding? Um, let's go do something fun. So we've, um, we had a little event at a game like place here in Vanderbilt and it was like an absolute blast. Um, we brought in uh, people, uh, we had a lot of international students who weren't totally getting how to use the American health insurance. So we brought in um, folks to talk to us about our health insurance. So it's just been a really cool way to um, kind of all band together to both have some fun and kind of learn from each other. So yeah, that's, it's a lively uh, atmosphere. For Josh, what about you? Yeah, I think, I think you two pretty much covered it. Um, and also because I'm relatively new to Vanderbilt, I think um, you were in a better position to talk about it. Also last year, uh, because of COVID, there was a lot of uh, restrictions here and I have not been able to fully explore uh, to the extent that I would have wanted to, but definitely, yeah, there is no lack of uh, resources to, to 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 explore to you know in in different 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 aspects of your academic and personal life. Yes, there is a lot going on on campus. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, so next question: So after you graduate, like, what do you want to do? Like, you're going to have you know you're going to have a degree from Vanderbilt. Um, for Maddie, it's going to be a second degree from Vanderbilt, but <laughs> Vanderbilt nonetheless. <laughs> um, um, yeah, like, what are your plans? Are you look? Do you want to go into research? Do you want to go into academia, industry? I mean, yeah, talk to us. Okay. Uh, oh, I'll go. Yeah, uh, I want to go back into industry. Um, I've loved being in academia, but I like the kind of like pace and like. Um, I like applied problems. It's just where my brain goes and to the point that some of my colleagues will tease me that literally uh, I'll always say like, well, what, what would the system operator think? And he like laughs because he always catches me saying that. Um, so I kind of like being in that position to take cutting edge techniques and figure out how to work for, for applied systems. Um, so I'm really interested in sort of like quantitative finance, quantitative risk kind of stuff because that's what I do now. Um, yeah, just really excited to kind of use some of the more um, exciting techniques, but use it in more that that applied ways, um, just because that's where my experience and my uh, thought process goes. Kind of following that up, I, I think my response is going to be really similar. Um, I love kind of being in the role of helping integrate data into decision making processes um, in a lot of different ways. But uh, I personally have been gravitating towards um, jobs that are working for the, the government. There are some really cool jobs at uh, USGS, NASA, Forest Service, NOAA, Weather Ser the National Weather Service, et cetera, that um, have really struck a chord with me. So I could see myself going that path. Um, but then more recently, I've, I've had a lot more conversations with engineers that have been um, working at, at a variety of you know, engineering firms that um, are doing really cool stuff. So I'm considering that as well. Uh, I recently had the opportunity to go to the TRB, the Transportation Research Board annual meeting and met um, a bunch of uh, engineers there doing really cool uh, hydrologic and hydraulic modeling and, and thinking through a lot of big problems at the intersection of civil, in civil infrastructure and water. Um, so something in that in that direction for sure. Uh, luckily, I have a few more years to to figure out the next step. But I have maybe like a hundred dream jobs already kind of uh, in a list. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, um, 
I think my plans would also be in line with what, what Maddie just uh, described. Uh, I want to be in a decision-making role in, in, in civil engineering industry. Um, so that's why I, I, first of all, went after this degree uh, so that I could make use of, uh, I could get into decision-making role uh, within, say, water resources or any other infrastructure system um, to be more generalizable. Uh, to the to the industry, um, so yeah, that's where I'm gravitating toward as well. All right, and, and I think that's something important for the viewers to really see is you know students that graduate with a PhD degree have many options when it comes to you know professional opportunities. It does, it's not just academia, although there are those that will go into academia, but you do have students that go into government agencies or they go to national labs or they're in industry and they're, there's just numerous different opportunities. So uh, it's a very adaptable um, skill, so to speak, when it comes to that. Um, so we do have four minutes left. So I'm gonna try to fit one question in, uh, which is if you can talk briefly about, you know, being at a place, you know, like Vanderbilt, you know, working, doing research here, um, you know, just for your own professional development, there's got to be a great network. There's got to be great networking opportunities here. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how do, what's the best way, if, you know, to take advantage of those opportunities or, or to network or to really utilize those resources and platforms, whether it be getting in contact with the alumni association or perhaps, you know, really being able to collaborate with the people that your advisor may introduce you to and just having those types of opportunities. Yes. Um, I think uh, having a, a well-connected advisor and uh, multiple projects in different fields um, is, is, is primary to, to, to enhancing your network, uh, along with the people that you meet uh, on campus uh, during classes, during events. Um, but yeah, uh, like depending on what kind of projects your advisor is working on and like what what are, what are the different collaborations between uh, different labs within the university or between universities or between a university and an industry? Um, I think these are pretty good uh, ways to make connections and through research um, uh, and through conferences, through um, um, uh, different seminars uh, and, and, and other events that, that are so regularly happening on campus and outside. And I think Maddie, um, uh, just had a really good experience uh, related to that, and I'd I'd let you pick up from here. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a great kind of overarching summary of all the things that popped into my mind with this question. Um, of course, your advisor is a a great kind of person to go to for those kind of connections and and professional development. But I'll say, my experience so far has been really all of the, the faculty and professors I've been in contact with are almost equally as excited to help you get connected to people that you want to be connected with, you know, start work and research and just trains of thought on different topics. Um, so even if it's someone that's not your advisor that you're interested in, um, more often than not, they'll be super excited to connect with you. And then I think that the the peers that we connect with are, are one of the most kind of critical and wonderful uh, networks that we form here. I think that like, I, I've just met some of the most fantastic researchers and scientists in courses. And I can picture staying in touch with, with many of these people, uh, a few of whom are on the call right now uh, for, you know, many years to come. And um, I think that Vanderbilt's a very exciting place to be. I will add, I think Vanderbilt in particular does a great job, and I've said this before, but but stressing kind of interdisciplinary connections and fostering them. Um, I have a fellowship right now through the Robert Penn Warren Center for Humanities, uh, and it's me and six other um, colleagues from all dis different disciplines. I'm the only uh, engineer in the group, but there's people in the sociology department, uh, environmental science department, education, um, sociology, et cetera. And I think that the really cool thing is that not only am I kind of, I guess, growing my network within the engineering field, but really uh, across many disciplines and Vanderbilt does a, a great job fostering, fostering that connection. 
the one thing I'll add, um, especially for people who are maybe a little more on the shy spectrum like me, I think the best thing you can do your first year is just to say yes to things that um, we are a department that likes connection and inter interdisciplinary opportunities. So people are going to say, do you want to go to this talk or do you want to meet this person? Um, especially your first year, just say yes to things, meet as many people as you can. Like literally just get coffee with the professor and say, tell me about your research or stay a few minutes after class and just talk to people. Um, especially that will grow and grow and grow to more and more opportunities, but um, also just doing a good job on your research. <laughs> but the best thing to do is just say yes, meet people. All right. No, wonderful. Thank you so much. And that is going to do it for tonight. We are at eight o'clock. Uh, I, th I think we could have just like scheduled a whole other hour of just, you know, just to continue the conversation. There's so much more we could talk about, but um, I think this really gave a really nice snapshot to those students that are thinking about applying into the civil engineering program. So um, I do want to thank you all, Oliver, Maddie, Rajesh, also Emily, who is also on the call, who helped organize tonight's event. Thank you very much, Emily, for doing that. Um, thank you all for taking your time out. And I'm sure, you know, for the viewers, this was a blast for everybody, just as, you know, I, I had fun definitely, you know, doing this as well. So this has really been great. Um, but yes, no, that will do it for tonight. Thank you so much and stay safe. All right. Have a good night.